I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse, unquote. And did you arrive at any diagnostic conclusions? Yes, I did. And what were those? This man knew me and saw me in a way that no one else had. He grabbed my face and pulled me into him and really kissed me. Did, but we were filming a scene. Did he use his tongue? Were you aware of Mr. Depp's professional reputation at the time you became his agent in October of 2016? I would say objection leading, and I think it's going to call for hearsay. I'll overrule at this point. Go ahead. I believe I was. What was your understanding, if any, of Mr. Depp's professional reputation at the time you began representing him as his agent in the fall of 2016? Uh, Johnny's reputation, in my opinion, was very, he was very well regarded and respected by peers uh, in the artistic community. Um, Your Honor, uh, Your Honor I'm, I'm going to object. He, first of all, he says, in his opinion, which he's not an expert witness, and second, he's now going into hearsay. No, I'll, I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. Her, Mr. Wiggum, Her yeah. Honor, you may continue. Uh, well regarded, respected extremely talented, artistic. Mr. Wiggum, when did you first see Ms. Hurd's op-ed in the Washington Post? It would, have, it would have been right contemporaneous when it came out. And drawing your attention specifically to the third paragraph of the op-ed, Ms. Hurd writes, quote, two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women, for women who speak out, unquote. What, if anything, what, if any, understanding do you have of that reference? That it was regarding Johnny and uh, their relationship. Directing your attention to the title of the article, quote, Amber Heard, colon, I spoke up against sexual violence, unquote. What, if any, understanding do you have of that reference? Objection, Your Honor. It's irrelevant what his understanding is. Uh, I'll, I'll allow it. That, that, was, uh, that was rather shocking, I remember, because it was the first time I'd heard an allegation of sexual abuse. Ms. Hurd writes, quote, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse, unquote. To what does that refer? Objection, Your Honor. How would he know what it refers? Uh, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. How, if at all, was the op-ed different from other articles you had read about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard relationship? It, you know, it was a first-person account coming from the victim. Uh, it's extremely impactful. Impactful in a in a good or bad way. On, you know, with respect to Johnny, it, it was it was catastrophic because it was coming from you know, you know uh, a first person account. It was not from a journalist. It was not from someone observing. It was from someone saying, "This happened to me." Between December eighteenth, two thousand eighteen, which is the date that Ms. Hurd's op-ed appeared, and October two thousand twenty. To what extent, if any, did Mr. Depp perform in any studio films? Zero. No studio films. How, if at all, did Ms. Hurd's op-ed impact Mr. Depp's ability to land roles in studio films between December 2018 and October 2020? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for Hearsay Foundation and expert. I'll sustain expert. that objection. Next. What happened, Mr. Wiggum, after the op-ed but before October 2020, with respect to Minimata. So the, the op-ed came out in December, and it was, it was right as we were going on Christmas break, and uh, our Minimata was supposed to start in January, and I, I remember it was very, very difficult to keep Minimata together. The, the financing became shaky. The, the budget had to come down, Johnny's fee came down in order to save the movie. Was your outreach to Mr. Bruckheimer and Mr. Bailey successful? Objection leading. 
I'll allow it. No. I successfully made contact with them, but I was not successful in rescuing pirates for Johnny. In addition to Pirate 6, did Mr. Depp lose any other films between December 2018 and October 20? Objection, Your Honor. First of all, I don't think he testified that he lost Pirate 6. Second of all, it's she's, a she's now contradicting uh, the witness's uh, testimony, oh, which no, is no, inappropriate. Both of you, the other both way. of you overruled. Let's go. Next, go ahead and answer the question. Yes, it, you know, after, after the op-ed, it was impossible to get him a studio film, which is what we normally would have been focused on in that time period. What, if anything, does the term love bomb mean? So, so the love bombing is, um, it's more of the colloquial term for, for the younger folks here, but, you know, where you shower someone with, with affection and love, you know, in this contrition and calm phase where, you know, you're, everything about you is special. You're the best thing in the world. I'm never going to do anything to hurt you again. I would never let anyone hurt you. And it could be selling, sending flowers and buying gifts or going on trips or your favorite restaurant. Um, and that is, you know, a way of where the man is trying to make those amends um, and then it gets the woman hooked. So they get hooked on the kindness. They get hooked on the love. They don't get hooked on the abuse. I've never met one woman in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that I've evaluated who was not concerned about the violence. They're all concerned about the violence, but they go for the love. So in, in your experience with, with these dynamics that you've described, does the victim ever yell at her partner? Absolutely. Why? We know from the research that women use verbal and physical acts of aggression in these relationships. That's not uncommon. This has been researched for five decades. Um, and a woman may yell at her partner because she's angry. And it, anger is a very normal emotion to having been abused. She can also be afraid but they don't have to be mutually exclusive. We can absolutely, as human beings, feel two or three or four different motions at once. Um, you know, people do often say to me, oh, she would never yell at him if she knew he was gonna hit her. And that's not true. That's just patently not true. That doesn't, that's not supported in the research and that's not supported in my clinical practice. You know, the problem is, is there's a classic double bind and the violence has been so normalized in the relationship now, she gets hit if she does yell, she gets hit if she doesn't yell. So for women who feel at certain moments that they need to preserve some sense of their autonomy and their independence and stand up for themselves, they will yell and they will fight back even though the risk of violence is there. Um, so it doesn't mean that she's not afraid and that she's not concerned about the violence. And it doesn't mean she doesn't also use placating and compliance strategies most of the time as well. Does, does, in the cases that you have and in your experience, um, does the abuse typically take place in front of others? No, I mean, this is classically what we talk about behind closed doors. Most of the intimate partner violence, the domestic violence happens, you know, in the privacy of your own home. So sometimes we see the remnants of it, the after effects, or, or uh, victims talk to their friends or family about it. Um, but very rarely are you seeing it happen, the actual blow-up phase happen in the middle of witnesses and other people. What does the term bystander effect mean? So bystander effect means what happens when people are aware that domestic violence is happening? What happens when they're aware, even if they're not seeing it, um, that it could be happening? And what happens is we know that it's very difficult for people to to stand up and say something. It's very difficult, especially in situations where um, it, there's a, a larger community of folks and the person who perhaps is perpetrating the abuse is the leader of that community. Um, it becomes very difficult to go up against that, to go up against the sort of the head honcho of the community. Um, people are very fearful of losing their jobs. Um, I've seen this time and time again in, in the cases that I've worked on. Um, you know, the Boy Scout cases or the clergy abuse cases, 
you know, all of those type of cases where the, the USA Gymnastics, where when we go back and we look, we see people new. But the secretary doesn't want to lose her job. She has kids to feed. The guy who, you know, checks you in, he doesn't want to lose his job because he has a mortgage to pay. So people are quiet and they don't say anything. Um, you know, and then other people are, are very, um, it's a very worrisome dynamic. They don't want to put their foot out there if they're wrong and maybe I didn't see it right or I don't really know what happened. I certainly am not going to jeopardize my job um, if I don't really know what happened behind closed doors, even if I see a trashed room or a bruise. Um, and then people still believe it's a family matter. You know, it's between Amber and Johnny. Let them figure it out. You know, I'm not going to get in the middle. Um, so those are dynamics that happen. What's the objection? Uh, motion to strike. What's the objection? We identified two names in the answer. Uh, overrule. Next. Thank you. Question. Did you finish your answer? Uh, yes, I believe okay. so. Okay. What about mutual abuse? What is that? What role does that play? So mutual abuse isn't really a term of art that we use. What we look at is situational couple violence and intimate partner violence. And when we look at situational couple violence, that really does characterize the majority of types of violence and abuse that happens in relationships. That's when a couple gets out of hand. They may push, shove, slap, yell, say some things that they don't want. And it's not that those behaviors are OK, but those are sort of what the, our, our larger sale community-based studies say happens in these relationships. That's distinguished from intimate partner violence, what I'm talking to you about, that has this constellation of symptoms and is rooted in um, the abuse of power and control. Is there research that addresses this mutual abuse? Yeah, there's research that addresses what does um, gender symmetry look like, male and female. Are they the same? Um, and there's certainly, as I said, research that on the um, the lower end types of violent behaviors, push, shove, slap, you know, we may see similar rates between men and women. In psychological aggression, yelling, name calling, putting down, in some of our big community scale studies, we may see similar rates of perpetration in those behaviors. Um, but then there are, you know, other situations where we don't have gender symmetry. And what the research talks about very clearly is you have to examine context. You have to examine the differential of power and control and coercive control in the relationship to make a full determination. Do women use violence in relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Again, we've known this for five decades in our research. We've been studying this since the 70s. And when we look at what happens, you know, women do report their use of violence. Um, the majority of violence that we do see is what we call reactive violence or self-defensive violence or sometimes violence that's perpetrated independently of, of an assault of something that's going on. But mostly that when the partner begins to come violent, then she may become violent and fight back. Um, and that's not an uncommon dynamic, that if somebody is being pushed or shoved or hit, that a person would fight back. That has been established um, in the research. And what, if any, effect does that have on changing the power dynamics or the structure? Well, you have to find out, does it? Does her use of violence change the overarching power structure of coercive control and violence and abuse in this relationship? And you have to examine those variables to see does it or does it not? Can men be victims of intimate partner violence? Absolutely. Um, certainly, we know that we have to be careful of gendered stereotypes. We can't go in and think, oh, only the woman is the victim or, and only the man is the perpetrator. That just does not comport with the research. We know that uh, the research also shows that we can have domestic violence in same-sex relationships. My, my very first case was a same-sex domestic violence homicide in Brooklyn. Um, so I've been, that was in 1998. So I've been examining and treating individuals in a variety of types of violent context. Um, so we have to be careful that that bias doesn't get in our way when we're evaluating a particular situation in a particular case. Um, that said, we do know that there still are differences. You know, in a heterosexual couple, in a male-female dyad, the research still is clear that there are differences. Men still perpetrate more severe acts of violence. 
Women are still more likely to be injured. They are much more likely to suffer sexual violence at the hands of their partner. They're more likely to be intimidated, afraid, and they're much more likely to be killed. So we know that those differences exist, but we do examine you know, in those individual circumstances knowing that either one could be a perpetrator or a victim. Ms. Hurd's report of intimate partner violence um, and the records that I reviewed is consistent with what we know in the field about intimate partner violence, characterized by physical violence, psychological aggression, sexual violence, coercive control, and surveillance behaviors. Ms. Hurd demonstrated very clear psychological and traumatic effects or the exacerbation of trauma from those statements that Mr. Depp made through his attorney. There were three statements um, that we evaluated to see how they affected her emotionally and psychologically, and it was in my determination that they did. And did you arrive at any diagnostic conclusions? Yes, I did. And what were those? I diagnosed uh, Ms. Hurd with post-traumatic stress disorder. In order to have a, to meet criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder, you have to have an actual cause. It's one of the few diagnoses, diagnostic entities that we have to have a cause for. And um, the cause was the intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. That was the, what was pushing the symptoms. That was what's related to the intrusive phenomena. That was related to her avoidance. That was related to her um, differences in her mood that was related to her avoidance efforts. Um, so it was the, the cause was the intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. Why are you here? I am here because my ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. And how do you feel about that? I, um, I, st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible for me to sit here uh, for weeks and um, relive everything. Um, hear people that I knew, um, some well, some not my ex-husband, with whom I shared a life. Um, speak um, about our lives in the way that they have. Um, this has been one of, the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through, for sure. What happened next with respect to any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, then we fell in love. Uh, we went on this press tour, and we went. It, it was it was a beautiful and strange time. You know, we went from we we're flying from one not together, but you know, going from one city to the next, Europe, um, New York, Los Angeles, as I said, and we're just traveling around talking about this movie that we did together, that we participated in together, and we were falling in love, sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like, I didn't, know, I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, what, is it, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no? It says, why no? And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking. Uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all, and I laughed. It was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking, and he slapped me across the face. He has the window down. He's smoking. Um, it wasn't all the way down, but you know he's constantly smoking. And at some point, he starts howling out of the window, and then grabs. We had two small dogs. Well, one was Johnny's dog and one was my dog, but he grabs, if I, if I remember correctly, Boo, the, the, his, his dog, um, slightly chunkier um, teacup Yorkie, and he grabs this teacup Yorkie and holds Boo out of the window of the moving car. And he's howling like, 
like an animal. He's like grabbing my, my, my breasts, he's touching my thighs, um, he rips my underwear off, um, and then he, he <laughs> proceeds to do a cavity search. He was looking. He said he was looking for his drugs, his cocaine, his coke. I was wondering how I, somebody who didn't do cocaine, and was against it, that was in and of itself causing problems in our relationship. How could I hide? Why would I hide his drugs from? Like, I, like he was insinuating that I was doing it or something. It made no sense. He says, "Hey, man, you think you're touching my girl?" You think you're touching my girl? That's my girl. And he gets louder and louder. And she kind of did this thing half understanding what was going on. I think she kind of started to cry at this point, but she kind of threw up her hands and Johnny grabbed her, her wrist and kind of twisted it and pulled her into him and said, do you know how many pounds of pressure it takes to break a human wrist? Huh? And he kind of held her and she just, she just looked frozen. Because when it was good, it was so good. You've never felt love like that. At least that's how it felt. <laughs> so much. I felt like he recognized me and I recognized him and there was just something there that that was the love of my life. And he was, he was, but he was also this other thing. He uh, basically was accusing me of doing this thing and of, of making them aware of his, tr uh, that he was drinking again. And he slams me up against the, the side wall of the bedroom of the, ca we were in the bedroom this whole time, but up against the wall of the cabin and slams me up by my neck and holds me there for a second and tells me that he, he could kill me. And that was an embarrassment. It was a bit surreal, you know, uh, filming in a place like Puerto Rico. It was beautiful. Um, it takes place in the 50s, so everything really looked beautiful. Then, you know, cars and clothing, the music. It was just, it was a very colorful, um, shoot in general. I, I, I couldn't have asked for, you know, a, a, a better scenario. I, I, I was on, on film. I mean, I was on set, um, reading my books and every, occasionally Johnny would talk to me and then he started to be really kind to me, uh, like more open with me, uh, when we'd have hot days filming, it, you know, there'd be this big SUV pull up and a security guard would kind of usher me into this car and it would have the AC blasting and I'd be <laughs> sitting in the back of the SUV just thinking what a strange experience the whole thing was. And, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of interaction on set until, um, until we did a scene that involved um, kissing. We, we had a kissing scene and it didn't feel like a normal, it didn't feel like a normal scene anymore. It felt, a, it felt more real. There are certain things that you do in the job to um, be professional, like when you have to do that sort of scene and you don't like, you. <laughs> You don't use your tongue if you can't, if you can avoid it. There's certain things that you do to just maintain a certain line, and it just felt like those lines were blurred. I mean, he grabbed my face and pulled me into him and really kissed me. Did, but we were filming a scene. Did he use his tongue? Yes. Okay. Now, did there come a time that um, you ended up visiting him in his trailer? Yes. Um... I think there was a, we would hang out if, 
you know, after or in between scenes or in between setups, we often were, you know, talking about things and would continue the conversation into the trailer, um, often with the director, Bruce Robinson was his name. Um, and then at one point we, we talk about wine. It's another thing that Johnny and I shared in common, a love for uh, wine, red wine. Uh, and we were talking about um, a kind of wine that I enjoyed and I was, you know, going on about how great this bargain wine was. And I didn't understand, you know, how much more sophisticated Johnny's taste in wine was. Um, so I was going on about the virtues of Malbec or something and I brought him a bottle of this wine and I set it down and at some point I'm, I'm, I'm going back to get back to set and he kind of kicked his like, you know, foot up in the air and basically kind of lifted the back of my bathrobe up and can I just stop you there? Why were you wearing a bathrobe? Because I was doing a scene. Um, it was a period film. So it's uh, took place in the fifties. And so I had all of this um, old undergarments that are for that time era um, on. And the scene involved me changing. Um, so I had all the, the costume on. And he kind of picked up the back of my robe with his boot. And I kind of turned around and like laughed, like giggled, you know. Um, it, I wasn't, I didn't feel... I just didn't, like, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, and it just kind of, I just kind of giggled and batted it away playfully, and uh, he he kind of playfully kind of pushed me down on this, like, bed sofa uh, that was in his trailer, just playful um, and flirtatious, and he said, uh, yum, and he kind of, like, lifted up his eyebrows like that, and I just giggled, laughed it off, kind of batted him away, and, you know, moved on, went back to set. And were you in a relationship at that time? I was. Okay. And was Mr. Depp in a relationship at that time? That was my understanding, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did anything else of significant happen during that, that time period while you were filming with Mr. Depp, other than what you've told us? We just had this... You know, it, it was a friendship, flirtatious thing. We, I felt chemistry. I felt this other thing that was that went beyond the pale of my job, for sure. Uh, Johnny clearly felt that way about me. Had indicated to me that that's how he felt in many different ways, and but at the same time, that's you know, we were both in relationships and it is a job and, you know, I, it was intimidating and I, I just remember feeling kind of intimidated and a little nervous about that and I also was in a relationship so we went our separate ways and we didn't hear, I didn't hear from him for a long time. So describe for the jury your interactions with Mr. Depp during the press tour. Well, on the first stop of the, well, First stop, the beginning of the tour was Los Angeles, where we both li lived, and we did a press day, normal press day, and then at the end of it, uh, I was invited uh, by Johnny to come up to his room to have a drink with uh, him and the director uh, of the film. And I went up to the room um, to see both him and Bruce, um, but. As soon as I got there, Johnny said Bruce wasn't going to make it. So I stayed. Johnny and I started talking. Uh, I told, He asked me about my relationship. I said, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going through it. Um, I'm going through the separation right now, and it's been, you know, a rough couple of months, but that's normal. And he said, well, that's same with, same with me. You know, it's been... I can't remember exactly how long he said it had been, but that he had split from the mother of his kids and uh, said that he understood. All right, and then what happened next? Uh, then we drank red wine and continued to talk, and the talking became us, you know, reconnect. You know, it was like reconnection was almost instant. Um, it was just 
chemistry, it's hard to explain that, but we sat on the couch and we talked and, um, you know, it, it felt like there was, uh, it, it felt like there was an electricity to the room and that's how I felt when I was alone with him anyway. And it was instant again. I was like, whoa. So, uh, on the, on the couch, we, we talked, finished some wine and then I got up and left. And as I went to leave, uh, he grabbed both sides of my face, uh, similar to what he did in, in, in Puerto Rico when we were filming that, that scene. And he kissed me and I kissed him back. And what happened next with respect to any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, then we fell in love. Uh, we went on this press tour and we went, it, it, it was it was a beautiful and strange time. You know, we went from, we we're flying from one, not together, but you know, going from one city to the next, Europe, um, New York, Los Angeles, as I said, and we're just traveling around talking about this movie that we did together, that we participated in together. And we were falling in love. I mean, it was just, you know, at the first dinner in London, he s sat me next to him. You know, he produced the film and was a part of controlling the film and was responsible for different things than I was as a small, as an actor having a small part in it. And um, we went on this press tour and I think in London he sat, had me sat next to him at this, at a dinner. And then we ended up spending the night together in my hotel room. And for the rest of the press tour, we were, it, it was on, I, I'll put it that way. So when you returned to Los Angeles, what, if anything, took place with any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, once we were back from the press tour, you know, we had this, you know, whirlwind romance kind of just in these, like, beautiful places all over, and we're falling in love and not able to really show it because um, he wasn't, that the world didn't know about the split between he and his former partner. And of course, um, as a woman, I was like, is that troubling? You know, and I, I'd ask him, he, no, you know, he swore to me that they hadn't even shared a bed for a year and that they were, but they were protecting the kids and not publicizing it. So, or not making it known to the press. And so we kind of had to be a little bit under the radar, not a little bit, we had to be really under the radar um, because, as Johnny pointed out, that the world would blame me um, and call me a homewrecker, uh, even though I had nothing to do with it. So we were secretly dating, and then, you know, it was it was it was beautiful. It, it was um, I felt like this man knew me and saw me in a way that no one else had. I felt he understood me. I felt he understood where I came from. I, I felt like, I felt that like when I was around Johnny, I felt like the most beautiful person in the whole world. You know, it made me feel seen, made me feel like a million dollars. And that kind of feeling where, you know, he's just, lavish gifts and lavish expressions of love and how he had never met a woman like me. I mean, I remember he took the foil off of the, off of this uh, bottle and put it on my ring finger. And I had only been with him like days, you know, or maybe, maybe it was weeks at the time. Yeah, it was probably about a few weeks, but it just felt very intense. But we weren't doing normal life stuff. We weren't like, stuck in traffic with each other. We weren't going to the grocery store and doing life. We were like hiding in these places around the world. He had a lot of, he has so many homes. And so we'd be in one of those homes or my home at the time. And it would be like a bubble, like a, like we were in this little bubble of secrecy and it felt like a warm glow, as we would say. Just music and, and, and the kind of, books that we both loved and poetry that we both knew by heart. And it, it was, um, it felt like an, 
it felt like a, a dream. It felt like absolute magic. Did there come a time early on that you ended up going to his Bahamas Island? Yes. Uh, so shortly after, you know, we I think started dating October of 2011. And, um, the, you know, as I mentioned, this bubble, you know, where he'd come over to my house and not leave for like three or four days, you know, just smoking cigarettes and playing music and reading poetry to me or painting me or, you know, just talking. Um, and then he would disappear. And there'd be just no way to get a hold of him, no way to contact him. At, at first, I didn't really think anything about it, but um, he disappeared uh, at one point uh, and then came back and said he was dealing with something, some health issue, and uh, would I join him in the Bahamas? And that I think that's when I learned he had an island. And I was on a trip with a, a friend of mine in Spain, and I, it was for the holidays, and I kind of rerouted my trip to so I could come and land in L.A. instead of, I mean, landing in Miami instead of L.A. so I could go and meet him on the island. And he had uh, Keenan come and meet me on that um, on that trip, like in in Miami. I get off one plane, get onto another, and go and join him on his private island, and. Uh, I noticed he was drinking Beck's and uh, tea, but like lots of tea, like lots of tea. Uh, and I, I didn't foolishly think anything of it. Um, I just, you know, thought the man really seriously, I missed it before, but really, really loves tea. And we had this beautiful, I don't know, less than a week probably, um, trip in, in the Bahamas, a private island, beautiful sandy beaches. Scene, like, it's a scene that you just don't, I had never experienced anything like that. Um, it was a beautiful place, a beautiful time. And uh, we fell, um, I fell head over heels in love with this man. So after the Bahamas, I assume you came back, and we're talking, are we talking now early 2012? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So what were you doing work-wise while you were dating him in this early stage? What I always do, I would be taking job to job to job, going from one movie to the next, um, mostly not filming in L.A. So weirdly, you live in L.A. to to go shoot on location in other places. So when I was in town, we would go back to this bubble, this like insular bubble with beautiful blaringly loud music and no one else and nothing else. And then, you know, I'd, I'd go off to, to work. Uh, and so would he. Uh, well, eventually, yeah, he left to shoot Lone Ranger, I believe. And so I, we've heard a little testimony about boots. What, if anything, did you do to help Johnny with his boots? Well, I mean, I, um, I suppose that I took off his boots uh, and it made an impression on him and I, would, I was happy to, you know, anything I can do to, to show love, um, certainly how I felt about him. But if he wanted to take off his own boots, he, he certainly could. What if, any, uh, what if anything did you do with respect to knives during the time period you were with him in the Lone Ranger? Objection leading. What if anything? Overruled. I, uh, Johnny had a thing for turquoise and uh, that eventually, you know, being in the Southwest, it happens really, it can happen really quickly. I also too really love turquoise and he has a, um, he loved knives. He loves a lot of things. When Johnny loves things, he does it a lot, lots of it. Uh, so he had these daggers that he had given me that really, they were beautiful in design. Um, and uh, they're, you know, long curved daggers. Uh, and he just talked a lot about knives, had a knife and gun collection. Uh, and was quite proud of it. And at some point, I, I don't really remember exactly when it was, but I, at some point I picked up a, what I thought was a really beautiful turquoise-handled um, knife. 
and I uh, had it engraved with a saying um, that Johnny would say to me all the time, uh, which I, you know, thought was romantic, as funny as that is to say now. And what was the expression, the saying? Uh, until death, uh, um, hasta la muerte in Spanish. Now, by the time that you're visiting Mr. Depp in at, during his shooting of uh, Lone Ranger in the June through August 2012 time frame, uh, what, if any, relationship has he developed with your family? Oh, well, starting really early on, Johnny was so kind, so generous to my family, but especially especially my mom and dad. He just really, he met my dad, and um, my dad's a big personality. Uh, he's, a, he's a rowdy guy. And uh, Johnny just all of a sudden, I had never noticed, you know, Johnny have a southern, all of a sudden Johnny had the southern accent and was really like buddy buddies with him. And they really seemed to get along very well. They're, you know, just like instantly he was giving my dad gifts. He gave him guns. He gave him knives. They had this, I mean, Johnny just really just showered my dad. And my dad's a, a working man, you know, um, salt of the earth guy. And he was just like, you know, floored. He's getting all these amazing gifts and being invited to come on to these locations. And, you know, Johnny's this big movie star. And my dad was just like, you know, I think my dad would have married him himself, not <laughs> if I hadn't. And he just instantly, he gave my mom jewelry, brought her out to come and see me while I was visiting Johnny uh, on on Lone Ranger in, in some part of the Southwest. I think it was Colorado. He gave her this beautiful turquoise necklace. And I mean, that, yeah, they were they were definitely um, taken by him. And what if any relationships did Mr. Depp form with your friends? Well, Johnny's so generous and can be this really, like, overly generous almost, you know, like showering you with gifts and compliments and just, I mean, like, you know, and he has access and means to really, you know, we're not talking about giving you a card. We're like talking about just these like extravagant trips or these extravagant gestures, and it's it's a lot. And he he did that with my close friends. I relied heavily on on my on my friends, and had a pretty strong support network with them. And he really just showered showered them with generosity and love and light, and invited them to come to these exotic places and flew people here and there. I mean, it's incredibly incredibly generous. So going back to the filming of The Lone Ranger, what, if anything, did Mr. Depp do with respect to a horse? Junction leading. What, if anything, overruled? Uh, Johnny, at one point, insisted on buying me a horse. And I, of course, said that's ex extravagant. I, there's no way I could accept that. That's how, also how will I take care of that horse? You know, it's just it's so extravagant. So I said no, of course. Eventually, he got a hold of my dad and worked it out with my dad, like what kind of horse to buy, and then showed me a picture of this horse and said, "It's yours. It's 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 coming here." I think it was being transported and he said you know that he had my dad's help on it picking out and you know I grew up on, on my dad's horses you know, I grew up riding with my dad so you know I, I went I had I had um, resisted for I think about like a month and a half or something of him kind of bringing up the idea and me saying that's a crazy gift no thank you no that's incredibly generous but I couldn't accept to all of a sudden I had a cult so he dropped me off in London, and when he dropped me off in London, we had a few days at this hotel that we first, you know, co like consummated our relationship in. You know, it was a, a when we were on the London press tour, and our relationship developed. 
um, that was the same hotel and we were in this same room, uh, which is a Johnny liked to be in the same room. And it was really sweet. He got down on one knee and said, I want you to be my girl, be my girl forever, my woman, my girl. I want you to be the rest of my life. Say yes to me. Uh, he said he wanted to spend every every day. Uh, he, he promised me that every day when I woke up, that I would wake up and he would make me smile at least once. And that would be his goal. And, you know, I, I looked into his eyes and I saw my future hope, you know, like blind hope, so in love. I, it was one of the most, I can't describe that kind of joy, you know, I thought, you know, if we were married, then this is real, this is real, this isn't a thing of This isn't chaotic, and this will change. You know, I just, I had so much hope in that moment. Um, and I just said to him over and over again, are you serious? Are you real? Are you, are you serious? Are you sure? Because he didn't have a ring, so I thought, is this an impulse thing? You know, my experience, Johnny, could be very impulsive. And uh, he, uh, he said over and over again, be my, be my, be my woman forever. I want you to be my wife, my wife, my wife. Um, I, of course, cried. And we had a wonderful evening. And I still, he left shortly after. And I was, like, the next day, I had to go to work. And I was just, I couldn't tell anyone. And I wasn't sure. Part of me was worried that he didn't mean it. Or, you know, or, or that he wasn't sure. I just didn't want it to be an impulse thing. So I didn't want to mention it. I want to bring it up. I didn't want to. Um, and, and I kind of felt, I walked around for a few days like I had butterflies under my skin. And then my, he brought my dad out to London with my best friends. And my dad told me, you know, uh, Johnny has asked me permission for your hand in marriage. And and I, I felt like the luckiest woman in the world. And describe what took place at the engagement party. Uh, well, we walk in together, and we took some pictures and said a few hellos, and then Johnny disappeared upstairs uh, in, I guess it's like a coat room or something. It was in a big uh, um, abandoned building that was rented out for events. And he had disappeared upstairs um, almost the entire party, I would say, uh, it was kind of came down at the end, um, when we were leaving and came down once, uh, because he was at the time sharing drugs with my dad. Objection. Speculation. Lack of foundation. How do you know that he was sharing drugs with your dad? I was there. I watched it. Please continue. Um, my dad, at the time, was uh, on the same, was addicted to the same thing Johnny was. And so my dad had, um, either my dad ran out or Johnny ran out. I can't recall which of the two ran out, but there was a, you know, they, they needed more, of course, and uh, had to leave the party. My dad actually left with Johnny's, security to go get more drugs from objection calls for speculation how do you know that uh they told me uh, uh, hearsay sustained the objection okay and um they left to go whatever and then they came back with drugs and everything was okay in terms of the the withdrawal symptom or the i don't know what you call it at that point but uh he still um stayed upstairs and Are when you referring to, to mr depp Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, so continue. shortly after that, I tried to get Johnny to come downstairs, um, and he just snapped at me, just verbally um, told me to shut the fuck up. 
and uh, I I remember t talking to my mom about the irony of it. Okay, uh, we were an engagement party, uh, but it, that was a pretty that was pretty much it for the engagement party. And I went downstairs and entertained uh, guests and smiled and took pictures and put on a face and you know went about my evening. It was. It was really touch and go. Uh, he was filming with Paul Bettany, and uh, there were days when um, he wouldn't come home, or they couldn't get him up out of um, on set. He'd be asleep in his trailer, sleeping whatever he'd done the night before off. Um, I remember he missed a few days of work that way. I, it struck me because in in my experience. In our job, you you don't miss work. It doesn't matter how sick you are. You you go. It's, you know it's millions of dollars every single day. They're filming, and 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 I had not experienced someone um, who could effectively just control the set like that. You know, I mean to that extent. And one day he didn't uh, come home, uh, and I was worried sick. Um, I found out that he was in a hotel room with Paul Bettany. Objection, Bettany's. hearsay. Okay. Move forward. When he came home, they had to carry him home. Objection, hearsay. Did you see that? I watched him? it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, please continue. I, I watched. Um, it, actually, I was, I was shocked that he could do it. Um, one of the security guards carried, carried Johnny like a baby into the house. And I looked at that and I mean his his boots were hanging over the security guard's arm who had to negotiate getting through the doorway carrying Johnny like this. And I thought, I watched this, the, his assistants and the other security guards shaking their head, you know, just shaking their head, acknowledging this is how bad it is. And I remember thinking, this has got to be it. Like this has got to change. This is surely this is it. And uh, he was understandably very, very sick for at least two days, is my recollection. Um, and in that two days, I had a lot of conversations with this team. I won't say what they were. Um, but I w felt at that juncture very encouraged that everybody and myself were on the same page. And I felt encouraged that we were in a new chapter, that Johnny had finally hit rock bottom. And finally, he felt like changing for good. And I, I felt buoyed, you know, supported by these conversations I was having with people that he was close to, that he trusted. Before you finished rapping with Danish Girl uh, and were heading out shortly before, what, if any, communications did you and Mr. Depp have? Well, at first it was, it was great. Even though we were separate, it was so hard to, it, it was so hard to um, uh, leave, the, you know, leave right after you get married, especially considering that um, in Johnny and I's relationship, it was always so much worse when I went away to work. It, it just, that's when problems started. So... That was hard, but we communicated pretty consistently, and it was positive until it, it started to change. And it, I got the sense that he thought I was uh, sleeping with the director, and then it was with the, the, the actor I was filming with. Who was the actor you were filming with? Uh, Eddie Redmayne. OK. Uh, of course, I, not of course, I was not. Not that it mattered, but um, you know, I, I could do my best to feel the accusations, and then they would kind of subside, and I thought things were okay. And one day, right before I'm supposed to fly to Australia, he, uh, like, right the, I think it was the night before I was supposed to leave to go to Australia, he calls my uh, hotel room. Uh, apparently, I had a sense that the phone was ringing. Um, I think it was in the shower at the time. But not much time had passed, and I get a knock on the door, 
and it was someone from the hotel um, that I was staying at. The hotel staff had been sent up to the room because John Objection calls for hearsay and speculation. I'll sustain so, the objection. So don't tell what the staff said. What okay. happened next? Uh, then I start communicating with Johnny. And, and when you say started, I mean, did, were you, was he on the phone? Did you call him? What, what, what happened here? He called the room and then my cell phone, and then once I was on the cell phone, he was accusing me of not being in my room, so he called the room, and I had to prove that I was in the room because, you know, by answering the phone. And we had a lengthy uh, kind of circular conversation about uh, where I was and why I didn't answer the phone, uh, why I didn't answer the phone immediately. Uh, I, he didn't sound like he was connected to reality. It just didn't seem like, it, to me, it, it seemed like a, a previous pattern. I, I was unsure what to make of it because he wasn't right in front of me, but he was accusing me of uh, what it seemed like is uh, having, I guess, an affair or a reason to not be in the room that I got a sense from him was, um, you know, cheating or, it, it un, you know, that I was hiding something and I was, why I wasn't answering the phone and hence why um, I got the knock on the door.